All right, in this channel, we're going to be talking about GE dishwashers. I had a little issue with my dishwasher it about a week ago, but then I thought about it might be a good idea. I could show you what I went through. And I guarantee you in this video, you're going to probably have more stuff to know about a dishwasher than you ever want to know. And now, in this video, we're going to be talking about a flood switch. Here's a flood switch. Now we're going to be talking about this, we're going to show how to troubleshoot it, we're going to go over the circuitry, and we're going to be talking about what this little device can do, how it can prevent water from flowing into your machine, and thus it's not going to clean, or maybe you can get some water in and it's not cleaning good because the water's not heated, or maybe at the end of the cycle and the heater is not drying the dishes. And this could be all caused by this. So let's get started and see what this little thing is all about. I should also point out that since we're talking about a GE dishwasher, this flood switch is also used in other makes, you know, such as Whirlpool, KitchenAid, and others out there too. So, and also I'll put the uh, I'll put the model number for this particular series. And again, even though it's this series, other makes and models and series will still apply. The first thing we need to do is we need to get access to this here flood switch. So let's uh, show where that's at. So we're going to open up the dishwasher. And we're going to go ahead and we're going to remove the bottom rack. Alright, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to remove the lower spray arm. Now if you look right down here, you can see like there's a lock, lock nut. So what you want to do is you want to take this thing and you want to turn it counterclockwise and just lift it straight up. Now these two items right here are called vent caps. Uh, what they do is they relieve any kind of air pressure that might be down inside up underneath in the sump. So we're going to remove those by turning them counterclockwise. Now we're going to remove this here filter. This here is a fine filter. We're just going to turn it and lift it straight up. And you can see there's the filter right here. So if that's dirty, you want to go ahead and clean that. Get that all taken care of. Next on the list is we have this here coarse filter. So you can just lift it up and remove it and take it right on out. The next thing we have is this here is uh, what's called a filter adapter. So you can just put your hands in there and you just lift it straight up and then remove it. Now you're going to probably find, as you can see there's some water going to be down here in the bottom and that's perfectly normal. So what you want to do is get you a rag, get some paper towels, or if you got a shop vac, you want to go ahead and remove this water. Because when you remove this here flood switch, that water is just going to dump right on the floor. So let's go ahead and we're going to soak this water out. Alright, I'm not sure if you'll be able to see it, but there's two small screws down here. A quarter inch hex uh, nut driver. We'll get that. And um, I've already removed the water with a shop vac and took a paper towel and just kind of damped up any kind of excess water that might be in there. So we're going to go ahead and remove these two screws. Now if your hands are small enough you can just go ahead and reach in there and just pull it right out. And the other one is right over here. So we're going to go ahead and remove that one. And you can also you can just use a needle nose pliers or if you got a magnet you can use that so we can pull that on out. Now the next thing we're going to be removing is this uh, assembly plate. It's called a floor plate and we can just grab anything down in here. I got my needle nose and I'm just going to lift it straight on up and out. Now once, once you remove the floor plate you might see a little bit of extra water so I took a paper towel and just kind of damped it up just to remove a little bit more water. Alright so the next thing we want to do is we just want to kind of rock it a little bit. We don't want to twist it. It's not screwed in. It's just pressed in with an O-ring. So we're going to just lift it up and now we can see that we have a connector here. So we're going to flip it over and you can see this is a latch. So we're going to press this down and then we're just going to remove it. And I'm going to just go bend the wires harness here a little bit just so it doesn't fall back down in the hole. One of the first things you want to do is when you remove this here flood sensor is you want to flip it over. You hear that ball? That's the float. That's the first thing you want to hear. 
If you do not hear that, then you know that there's food debris inside that's frozen this here float. It could be frozen in a down position, could be in an up position, or maybe somewhere in between. But that's a good sign. Now, if you don't hear this float moving back and forth, then you know that food debris has got being caught up in here, has come down through here, and has frozen this float. The float is actually up in this assembly here, not down here, because you can't even see it. So we'll run you some hot water up in here, shake it back and forth until you can hear the float moving easily. Now, if once you hear it going back and forth, then we're going to proceed on to the next step. All right, so what we're looking at is the flood switch, and we're looking at it from the connector end. Now you can see that we have some male pins here. We have two rows. Now what I have is, if you look up here on the top, you can see there's a little cutout. This is where the latch from the harness comes in. Now if I look over here on the other side, you can see that it's flat. So you want to put the latch side up, right? Now let's take a look at our pins. If we look at this top row of pins, you can see that one of the pins is missing. Well, here you go. You see the whole top row, the three pins that's left? There's no wires connected to any of those pins, so you don't have to worry about them. But for reference, if you're relating it to a wiring diagram, if we start at the far right, this is going to be the pin 2. The one where there's no pin is pin 4. The next pin is 6. And the far left one is going to be pin 8. Now, let's go to the bottom row. The bottom row from the far right, we have pin 1. The next pin is pin 3. The next pin is 5. And the last row, uh, pin on, on the bottom row to the left is pin 7. The float is connected on pins 1 on the extreme right on the bottom and pin 7 on the extreme left on the bottom. So let's get, I'm going to get some couple of wires hooked on there and we're going to check that with our own meter. And also, I did a little reverse engineering, so I drew up a wiring diagram so you can see it a little bit more clearer maybe. And so here's the connector. This is uh, looking at it, you know, the flood switch. And it's exactly what I just said. So you can see there's the pin numbers on the top. And then here's our pin numbers on the bottom, which is we have four wires connected to those. And the ones we're looking at right now is pin 1 and pin 7. That is where the float is connected. All right, so I have the flood uh, sensor in a position that it would be just like if it was inside the dishwasher. Right now, you can see that the float is measuring zero ohms. I'm on pins 1 and 7, as we already mentioned earlier. Now, I'm going to, now, we're going to imagine that we had a flood condition and the float, the float is rising up. So I'm just going to take and flip it over. You can see it went OL, out of limits. Come back, back to zero. Okay. This is how you would check your float. Now, if you get point 0.1, point 0.2, point 0.3, point 0.4, they're about somewhere in there, you're okay. But if you get like 50, 100, or 1,000, you automatically know that that uh, float is bad. Now, we're going to be looking at the thermistor. The therm comes from thermal, which means heat, and ister comes from resistor. So, this is a resistor who changes its resistance based on the temperature. Now, if we take a look at the bottom row, we remember pin one is on the far right, then we got three, five, and seven. Well, the thermistor is on terminals three and five. So we're going to be checking the resistance of that thermistor to see what it is right now. And if we come over here and look again, we can see that these two pins, three and five, are for the thermistor. Now, if we're going to be checking the resistance of this thermistor, it's probably a good idea to know what is the temperature of it. Now, the thermistor, again, like the float, is located up here near the top. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use an infrared gun. I'm just going to measure the temperature. And it looks like we got about, oh, 72, 73 degrees, 72. Okay, all right. So there's our, there's our baseline, 72 degrees. Now we've got to say, well, what is that supposed to be? Well, let's take a look at the chart. If we take a look at the chart over here, 
and this this is going to be a lot more that you're going to find on the service information so if i come down i can see it's 75 degrees it's going to be around 10,450 or maybe you know round it off somewhere around 11k so i'm suspecting that i should get a temperature somewhere in this area right here so let me go ahead we're going to get our meter leads and we're going to connect it up to pins three and five and we're going to see what is that resistance all right, so it looks like we've got a reading of 10.96 kilo ohms, or 10,950 ohms. Now, if we take a look over here, you can see that we're just a little bit higher than we were at 75 degrees. But remember, we measured it at 72 degrees, so we expect our resistance to be a little bit higher than it was at 75. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. So this here thermistor is checking out okay. Okay, now let's take a look at uh, heating up the thermistor. Now, if we heat the thermistor up, that means the resistance should do what? Go, go down. Go down. Let us see if that's happened. So I got a heat gun here. I'm just going to heat the top of this here up, and you can watch our meter. You can see if, uh, what it's going to do here. And we can already see that the resistance is going right on down, just like it should. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we know that the thermistor is responding, so it can change its resistance based on this, on the temperature that it receives. Okay, so you saw that the thermistor was good. All right, but let's look at some possibilities of where it may not be good. For example, what if you measured the uh, thermistor and you got a reading that was pretty much like this. You got 0 0.1 or 0, 0.0 and it's very, very low. So you know that the thermistor is shorted. So in that case, it has to be replaced. So you have to get another flood switch. Okay, here's another scenario. You check it and now you get this reading, OL means out of limits. It means it has, this, basically the thermistor is open. So in a case like that, again, the thermistor is bad. Now, your final scenario where the thermistor could be bad is you have a resistance, but it looks like if you look at the table, it is way out of spec. In other words, you might be five, 10,000 ohms to where it should be for the temperature that you're checking it at. In that case, is skewed and again the thermistor is bad so you have to replace the thermistor or the flood switch now what i've done here is we're going to go ahead and we're going to put this back in we'll show you how it goes now you notice that we have an o-ring over here now what i like to do is i take a little bit of the rinse aid and i just put it around there just wipe a little bit just kind of lubricate it when it goes back down into the uh, into the sump housing all right so let's get over here and we're going to put this thing in what we want to do is we will want to find our latch side. Remember, this is the side that's got the cutout on one side. Remember, the other side is flat. So we find our cutout for our latch. We get our harness, and we can see our latch is up here on the top. So we're just going to put it together, and just we're going to just slide it in. Okay. Now what we want to do is we want it just to go straight down. We do not want to be twisting it. So I'm just going to put my connector in this direction. You can go this way, it doesn't really matter. So I'm just going to push it on down so it gets seated. Alright, so now it's pushed all the way down, it's seated. Now we're going to come back with our floor plate. And if you notice, you can see there's a little cutout right in here. So we're going to take this cutout, we're going to match it up, and we're just going to drop it straight on down. Now we're going to come back with our screws. Now I'm going to just use the needle nose pliers and I'm just going to take it and I'm just going to drop one screw down in the hole over here. I'm going to get my nut driver. I'm going to get it started. Not fully tighten it yet. Now I'm going to get my other screw with the nut driver. And I'm going to put him down in the other hole. Get my nut driver and go ahead and get him started. And just snug it up. Don't want to over tighten it. So we got that one. Now we're going to 
snug that one up, come back, double check him, he's good. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to take our filter adapter and we're just going to put him in there. Again, you can see the notch out here, just line it up with that, put it in, put it down. We're going to take our coarse filter, we're going to put him in there, just drop him in. Next we're going to take our vent caps and we're going to screw them in. Now we're going to finally put in our fine, uh, fine filter and we're going to turn it clockwise and if you notice there is an arrow here and there's an arrow here and these arrows when you get it locked they will line up with these arrows that's on the coarse filter. So put it in, turn it and you can see that the arrows lock on each side. Finally we're going to put on our lower spray arm. So if you notice right here, it's got these little notches on the side. So you can take these notches, line them up into the uh, cutouts that's over on here. And then we're going to just kind of turn it a little bit till they do like that. It drops down. And then we're going to take that lock nut and we're going to turn it clockwise. And then that locks it in. And the final step is to go ahead and put the lower rack in and you're done. Hopefully the flood switch took care of your problem. Now, let's say you check the flood switch and you got these issues that I mentioned early in the video. Well, we can get a little bit more deeper. And we're going to save that for part two because this part will take care of the majority of people. But for the people out there that has a little bit of electrical background, wants to get a better understanding of how the circuits work, we're going to save that for part two. So we'll see you guys in that one. You take care.